Antarctica is somewhere that I never thought I'd photograph. It just felt like such an impossibility that I never even considered it. That was until I was invited to be a leader on a floating workshop run by Nigel Danson, James Popsis and Maz Peter Iverson. Cue a huge hit of imposter syndrome as I surrounded myself with YouTube photographic royalty for 10 days. But what happened over the course of the expedition has, I think, completely changed how I think about photography and my work and probably my life as well. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. My primary aim for this trip was work, to produce a video documenting the trip for the guests that were on the workshop. If I could bag some bangers as I went along, then that would be nice. What I ended up capturing was some of the most beautiful footage that I'm ever likely to record. And in this video, I wanna show some of that footage and talk through some of the images that I got, as well as exploring why I took them and the challenges surrounding photography and video whilst in Antarctica. Everything you see here in terms of video was captured on a Sony a7S 3 a Sony a7R5, or a DJI Pocket Go 3. From a photography point of view, I use the Sony a7R5 and my Fujifilm X100V. I need to give a shout out to the guys at Sigma who very kindly lent me a 60 to 600 millimeter f 4.5 to 6.3 lens. I've not got that lens anymore because I had to send it back to Sigma, but for this trip, it was absolutely invaluable. They also lent me a 16 to 35 f 2.8 from their contemporary range, but that didn't get much of a look in. I tend to shoot everything 24 mil and wider these days because that's just what I prefer to do. These two were complemented by the 24 to 70 f 2.8 art that I've been using extensively for the last three to four years. And this is probably my favorite lens for both photo and video. So everything you see in this video was shot on Sigma glass, apart from the stuff I shot on this, but that should be fairly obvious. The trip to Antarctica started badly and it ended badly too, depending on your point of view. The plan was to fly to King George Island in the South Shetland Islands on the Sunday and get on our ship. That flight got canceled, so we got an extra day in Punta Arenas in Southern Chile, where I took some images that I'm pretty happy with, and I'll talk about them more in a dedicated Chile video. We didn't know whether or not we were gonna fly on Monday. The problem is you land on a gravel runway and you need to be able to, well, the pilot needs to be able to see this runway from the air, so the cloud has to be a certain height. We did manage to get a weather window on the Monday, thankfully, but it wasn't long after we landed and boarded the ship that the clouds dropped again. So we got pretty lucky that we were able to fly there at all. Having boarded the ship that was to be our home for the next eight to 10 days, depending on your optimism over the likelihood of a flight home. After spending some time learning how not to die when we were on board, we were then told the other rules and regulations we had to follow in Antarctica, like no putting down anything on the ground like your bag or jacket or your backside. Basically, the risk of bird flu and cross-contamination meant that the only things to touch our floor were our feet and our tripods, which had to be properly cleaned every time we got on and off, which made things a little difficult. We settled into our cabins with alarms set for sunrise for the following day, where we were expecting to be in sight of the Antarctic Peninsula, also known as Graham Land. The first morning of shooting was a bit of an awakening. It quickly became apparent that I'd be using the 60 to 600 mil most of the time. And despite being a photographer for over a decade now, I rarely shoot over 200 mil. When you're shooting at 600 mil or close to from a moving boat in the wind, it turns out you need a shutter speed a little faster than you anticipate. Especially if you make the amateur mistake of constantly leaving the lens hood on, which acts a bit like a parachute. I missed quite a few shots that morning because I just wasn't shooting at a high enough shutter speed, but quickly got into the groove. Thankfully, Antarctica is pretty bright, and with the noise removal tools available now, I don't think we need to be scared about pushing the ISO beyond what we think is acceptable. After all, a sharp grainy shot is better than a blurry non-grainy shot. And I had a lot of blurry non-grainy shots. 
There were some that weren't blurred though, and I quite like these iceberg portraits. I got a video of this orca pods here on that first morning and some shots of some humpbacks breaching. I'm no wildlife photographer and following this trip I'm not sure I'm ever likely to be one, but being able to see and photograph this was pretty special. One of the first things you think when you visit and see Antarctica is, holy shit, that's big. You then apply that to everything. The mountains, the iceberg, the glaciers. The size of it is just ridiculous. And we only saw such a small portion of it. They say 70% of the world's fresh water is locked up in Antarctic ice, which is hard to comprehend until you see it for yourself. The size of everything's just hard to get across on these images and in the videos. So trying to get scale across as much as I could was ever present in my thoughts whilst I was there. When you're on one of these expeditions, it's arranged so that you try and leave the ship twice a day via Zodiac boats. These take you on cruises to get closer to icebergs and to wildlife or take you to land where you get off and wander around exploring for a bit. We had a good mixture of the two and our first point of call was Recess Cove. And it was on this excursion that the overwhelm of the place really did hit. There you are merrily cruising around these incredible looking icebergs. The blues are really that blue by the way. And snow slowly falling around you when suddenly three or four 18 meter long humpback whales pop up next to you. Everyone was just in awe and capturing them kind of slipped from your mind as you just took in the spectacle. Once I gathered myself I managed to get some footage and a couple of images but honestly these are far from my best. The snow really threw focusing off and I don't know if that was because of the camera or the lens but I probably needed to focus manually which I'm not really sure I quite have the skill for. Remember, moving boat, whales appearing in different places, and that's before you even consider composition, exposure, and switching between video and photography. Honestly, I'm happy I got anything at all, but the memories I have from that 10 minute period are gonna last me so much longer than anything I captured. Like much of this trip, it's hard to put into words. The hike that followed at Recess Cove kind of paled into insignificance a bit. We saw these seals fighting on the shore before landing and then hiked up this hill which I shot on my Fuji and I really like this image and the spacing of everyone going up it's pretty much perfect which absolutely made it. I got a few more images I quite like here but nothing I'd class as amazing. This was kind of like my warm-up day and I think the more you shoot the more you get into a groove the more you see things and the things we saw and the things I shot certainly improved as this expedition went on. Our next destination was Peterman Island and this was our first proper encounter with penguins. Before that we had a dawn traverse through the La Mer Channel, said to be one of the most picturesque areas of the peninsula. Not for us. Low cloud shrouded the allegedly towering peaks either side of us but despite the low visibility the weather brought a certain atmosphere and sense of mystery to this part of the voyage. I took quite a few images here, none of which have made the cut, and you'll see why later. Spoiler alert, this wasn't our only time through the Lamar Channel. Peterman Island has two big things going for it. Penguins, and lots of them, and this amazing red hut constructed in 1955. Grusac Refuge, as it's called, is an Argentine naval refuge built amongst this colony of Gentoo penguins in an area named Port Circumcision. I didn't ask what went on in the huts for obvious reasons, but it did make for a great photo provided you focused properly and weren't distracted by everything else going on around you, something I seem to struggle with. The penguins were great to watch once you got used to the smell, a pungent combination of fish and shit that clings to your clothes for a good few hours after. Filming and photographing the penguins on Peterman was a lot of fun I quickly learned the ones who had recently been in the sea are a little more photogenic than those that hadn't. I spotted this rare headless penguin and had a great time watching this guy. If anyone knows what's got into him, let me know, but he was having a pretty awesome time. Back on the ship we got our first taste of proper light and I managed to get a few shots of some icebergs in the distant glacier and I love how you could use the light to separate the two like in this image which gives it a kind of 3D sort of feel. 
During lunch, we sailed to Faraday Station in the Argentine Islands, a crossing that claimed the lives of three members of the British Antarctic Survey in 1982 as they tried to cross the sea ice between Peterman Island and Faraday Station. This cross on Peterman Island is there commemorating their deaths. I'll put links to various Wikipedia pages and other websites in the description below in case anyone wants to read any further into the stuff I'm talking about. The Argentine Islands are home to Vodansky Research Base, which is Ukrainian. I know, it was long before that that I started to question who laid claim to what in Antarctica. Between the plane landing and us getting on the ship on day one, we'd passed through Chilean and Russian bases, and my phone had switched between being on Russian, Uruguayan, Chinese and Chilean networks. The main visiting spot here was Wordy House, named after Sir James Wordy who visited during its construction. He was Shackleton's chief scientist on board the Endurance. If you know little of Shackleton or the Endurance, then I implore you to read or listen to this book because it blows my mind that this tells a story that is true to life. And it's pretty hard to comprehend as you're sailing in luxury whilst eating your lobster dinner. The house was destroyed allegedly by a tsunami in 1946 but was rebuilt as it currently is the following year with record lows of minus 43 degrees C. It's hard to believe that people have overwintered here as they had to in 1960 when they failed to get back to their base. Pretty sure that's not for me. Another Zodiac cruise followed which gave us our first close encounter with these absolute behemoths around us. Honestly some of these bergs were eight stories high at least. It's hard to comprehend that seven eighths of them are underwater. I'm not sure I'd want to be this close when they broke away from the glaciers they were once part of. It's very, very humbling though. Being in the presence of ice like this makes you feel pretty insignificant. I got some shots of these seals too, which I think are crab eaters. Like the penguins, I think they're nice shots, but shooting wildlife in this way just it doesn't feel very me. I was yet to find a way of shooting the wildlife that felt entirely comfortable and in tune with what I wanted to capture and how I wanted to show it. Back on the ship, the next tourist hotspot was the Iceberg Graveyard and into Planal Bay. For reasons you'll see, this was one of my favorite parts of the trip. We got some amazing light that evening as we anchored. We didn't actually anchor. I think the ship is like self-positioning with GPS, but GPSing doesn't quite sound as good as anchoring. We anchored in front of Port Chaco at Booth Island with a landing there planned for the next morning. This is day three of our Antarctic adventure and we're in, honestly, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't even think of the name of the place. I think it's Chaco, Chaco Bay, maybe. I'll put the name on the screen. Um, but this is an absolutely beautiful day. I mean, look around me at this bay. You've got the ship there in the background. We've just hiked up to this point. You can see behind me, some amazing views down in this little cove where I think a couple of boats have wintered, which seems like an unbearable prospect, really. Um, but it's, oh, need to put my hike back on. It's nice to have a little walk up a hill and see it. And down the bottom, there's penguin colony, where there are three different um, species of penguin. So if we're gonna go and see that now as well, and, Honestly, it's just all a bit overwhelming. It's so spectacular. The air is so clean. There's so much wildlife and so many icebergs. And I'll just show you 360 now of all those icebergs. I 
Hiking up to the point I mentioned gave some pretty spectacular panoramic views of Port Chacot, a place where Jean-Baptiste Chacot overwintered in 1904 together with the crew of the Francais. Thankfully I didn't have to overwinter and was warm and happy with our capable ship firmly in sight and crucially not trapped in sea ice. As a timeless reminder of said happiness, Adam Gibbs took this shot of me and I'll speak a bit more about Adam in a bit because some of his photographic philosophies really impacted me as this trip went on. I got a lot of images here that I really like, some wider and some close up of the towering peaks around us. I mentioned scale earlier and I found that punching in like this also made the scale really ambiguous which just kind of lets the viewer's mind run riot on how big these things actually are. I wanted to show this panorama, not because I like the shot necessarily, but just to try and show a scale of the place. Take a look at this iceberg in the bottom corner. This is another shot of the same iceberg next to a ship, which is probably 10 or 11 decks high. Crazy. Port Chico is also home to a couple of penguin colonies, which I wanted to get to following the hike, but I just got far too distracted en route and didn't quite make it. The problem is that you can only take a few steps before something you're unlikely to ever see again presents itself. These penguins making their way down to the sea were just too irresistible in photographic terms. And I think it was here that something clicked. Showing wildlife as part of the landscape appeals to me so much more than getting close. So I knew I wanted to concentrate on that a bit more in terms of wildlife as the trip progressed. Earlier, I mentioned the iceberg graveyard. Well, the next hour was one of the most magical hours I've ever experienced. I'll shut up for a few minutes because this bit needs no words.
Our next point of call was Brown Base and the adjacent Scontorp Cove. The base seems relatively new compared to the others we've seen and that's for good reason. This is probably one of my favourite historical stories told to us on the expedition. In 1984, the base burnt down. However, this was done on purpose because the base's doctor had just learned from a resupply ship that no one was going to replace him over the course of the next winter and he'd already done one there. So he decided to set fire to it because no base means he couldn't stay there all winter. Unfortunately for him, the ship had already sailed off and didn't see the fire. So he and his colleagues were stuck there for a few days until a rescue ship eventually did pick them up. I don't actually know what happened to the doctor after this. If anyone does know, give us a shout in the comments below because I'd like to know how that story ended. The buildings of the base were really nice to photograph with the reds and the blues contrasting with the glacier behind, but it was hard to get the right angle from moving Zodiacs or the ship. The Zodiac drivers, to be fair, were brilliant in getting us angles that we were after, but sometimes it just wasn't possible. This also meant with 12 Zodiacs on the water, everyone there had slightly different experiences, which resulted in a lot of FOMO when looking at each other's images back on the ship. But it was always just as likely that you'd see something that others hadn't even been aware of, which was actually pretty great because although there were 90 photographers on this ship, Everyone saw Antarctica slightly differently to one another. The thoughts on wildlife in the morning continued to bounce around my head and I shot these images which I really like. The leopard seal perfectly replicating the calm that we were enraptured by. The calm waters of Scontalk Cove gave us a bit of a taste of what was to come over the next 24 hours and to me this was Antarctica at its finest. It's normally a pretty wild place. The week after we were there they had hurricane force winds on the peninsula so I'm glad we missed that. But when it was calm like this it was one of the most tranquil and peaceful places you will ever see. To me, this was by far the best morning. I don't think I've ever seen water so calm. A landscape so still or light, quite so beautiful as it was in Borgen Bay. The bay was first charted by the Belgian Antarctic Expedition in 1898. This book, Madhouse at the End of the Earth, is another astonishing read about the early years of Antarctic Expedition. And this is perhaps the most beautiful place I've ever been. The images I shot here are some of my favourites, and most of the ones you've seen are just from the deck of the ship. When shooting like this, one of the problems you have is you're often shooting down onto things, so generally the bottom third of the image is just sea, which can be pretty boring. What I enjoyed about shooting from the ship on this particular morning was the amazing reflections and bits of ice you can use to give a bit of interest to the bottom of the frame, something I tried to do throughout. The other issue with ship shooting like this is your timing needs to be good. Once an iceberg is past you, it's too late. I mentioned Adam earlier and Adam did a great talk while we were on board about shooting panoramas and how they particularly suit Antarctica. Because of the sea at the bottom of the frame and the sky at the top, there often isn't a whole lot of interest there. So you can use a panorama to focus the attention where you want it rather than have the viewer's eye lost on the negative space at the top and the bottom of an image. This is something I found myself to be doing more often than not. When combined with the beautiful Antarctic light that we had, you tend to get something really special. On this particular morning, the light had a certain clarity to it that I've just never really experienced before. The Zodiac cruises in the bay were just as special as sailing into it. You could hear the distant cracks of ice carving off the glaciers and echoing off the surrounding mountains like thunder, but you just had no idea where it came from. The size of the place meant that by the time the sound hits you, the ice is already bobbing along in the water. I grabbed this by chance, but let's be honest, it's not going to be on planet Earth anytime soon.
The clouds here really helped from a photographic perspective as they contrasted so well with the icebergs and gave separation from the background. The darker clouds also seem to accentuate the blues within the ice. Blue that is there due to the lack of oxygen in the ice, having been forced out over centuries by the unimaginable glacial pressure. This makes the ice so clear that the light penetrates deeper into it and all but blue wavelengths of light are absorbed resulting in this luminous blue colour. I love all of these images from Borgen Bay and this was probably my most productive day photographically. When the conditions speak to you like they did to me on that day, photography comes pretty easily and, and days like that don't come around too often. The relative peace was then shattered by an Antarctic tradition, the polar plunge. The sea temperature was said to be minus 1.8 degrees C, but honestly, standing around in these less than substantial robes was probably worse than the eventual plunging in, which I strangely enjoyed. As we sailed out of Borgen Bay, the conditions continued to be absolutely incredible, and I just carried on taking images and video clips, and I honestly didn't want this portion of the trip to end. The skies cleared as we sailed on towards Orne Harbour, en route to which we passed some more breaching whales which were too far away to really do any justice to capturing. We also saw these cool penguin icebergs, again hard to photograph because of the height of the ship and the lighting conditions which always make photography a bit more difficult, especially when most of what you're pointing your camera at is white. We landed at Orn Harbour for another hike up to a penguin colony where I got a couple more wildlife landscapes. I probably need a catchier name than this. I say it as if I've invented this style of photography and I really haven't. I didn't really do much other photography here. It was kind of nice to take it in for a bit rather than have my camera constantly pressed to my eye. As we headed back to the ship, a small sailing yacht came into the harbour and it struck me that to get there it must have navigated the 500 mile long Drake Passage, said to be the roughest sea in the world. No thanks, not for me. I wouldn't even fancy doing it on the ship we were on, never mind a small sailing yacht, something to ponder. That night we were treated to not only the coldest barbecue I've ever experienced, but also a vibrant Antarctic sunset which seemed to last for so long and was actually really hard to photograph as most of the time the scenery didn't look real. I tried to focus on some close-ups and just before the light disappeared I captured this abstract shot of a fold in the snow. It's not my usual style but it's a shot I absolutely love. I tried shooting into the sun a bit too, something I don't do all that often and I captured the spray from a passing humpback which I thought was kind of cool. Some people live for these conditions, but I found that I preferred the slightly darker and calmer conditions from earlier that day. To me, that softness really suits Antarctica more than a vibrant blue sky and palettefuls of colour. Unfortunately for me though, those conditions weren't really to be seen again. Named after Juan de la Sierva, a Spanish engineer who, as far as I can tell, never visited Antarctica, was our next port of call and was honestly mind-blowing. There was more ice than sea. In fact, the only sea you could really see was the sea where our ship cut a path through the ice. The glacier provides much of it, but currents prevent a lot of it from escaping and bring more ice from elsewhere into the bay. Don't quote me on any of these facts, although I have tried to ensure that they're as accurate as they can be. 
With the sun shining brightly, photography took a bit more of a backseat today as we took in the incredible amounts of ice around us. You could just about make out how big some were under the surface, which was cool. I turned my attention towards trying to capture the inner beauty of the ice around us, the brightly shining sun perhaps piercing more deeply than it would have done on a greyer day. Maybe. I've not fact checked that one. In fact, I've completely contradicted my point from earlier about the greyer skies accentuating the blue. In truth, I just don't know. On this day, the ice looks like it was being lit from the inside. Being here away from any kind of normal human life sends your mind into all sorts of crazy thought paths. As we battled through the ice, my thought process sounded a little bit like this. Time doesn't matter here. There's the shifts between the seasons, but otherwise you cannot really imagine much ever changing. Glaciers slowly move their way towards the sea and break off in seconds, but year to year I can't imagine things look much different. Icebergs can be lodged in place for years, slowly melting away into water which will evaporate and return as snow. We're always taught about the water cycle at school and how it takes a few days or maybe weeks for it to complete. Here it can take hundreds, if not thousands of years. There must be snow that fell on Antarctica that's been compressed down by more snow and just hasn't really gone away. And with data showing that ice began to form here 60 million years ago, who knows when that cycle might finish? This was all a bit too much for my brain to comprehend and my unimportance and inadequacy when confronted with something as special, vast and majestic as Antarctica became apparent. So I distracted myself from the discomfort by filming a seal and then retreated to the boat for a ginger cookie and a latte. Whilst the morning gave us calm conditions and blue sky, the afternoon zodiac jaunt gave us rough seas, strong winds and blue skies. Graham Passage, named after a whale catcher called Graham, I kid you not. I'm unsure whether that was his first name or his surname, or maybe his surname was Passage. I don't know. Anyway, Graham Passage was hard to shoot. There were these massive icebergs that were the size of castles, but getting any isolation or sense of scale into shots of them was really difficult and not helped by the aforementioned blue skies. I'm not trying to sound like I'm complaining, as it was like everywhere else we experienced. Absolutely incredible but it was really hard to shoot, especially in these conditions. That was until we spotted these bergs and I found myself being grateful for the sun because the light coming through here was just like something from a dream. Shortly after this, our zodiac broke down and that happening suddenly makes you incredibly grateful that there are others around to help out. That wind pushes you quite quickly towards glaciers and icebergs that you really do not want to be near. Back on the ship, our plans were set to change because strong winds were moving into the peninsula so we needed to make our way back across the Bransfield Strait to the South Shetland Islands and seek shelter for the final two days of our cruise. As dawn broke the next day, we made our way into Port Foster and the volcanic caldera that is Deception Island, the name of which just makes me think of Shutter Island. Thankfully, there was no asylum full of deranged lunatics aside from our ship, but there was this incredible looking whaler station. We couldn't land here due to the strong winds, which was a bit rubbish as this was near the top of places in Antarctica that I really wanted to visit. We did manage the landing at the more sheltered Telefon Bay, which felt like we'd been transported back to Iceland. It was strange to stand on soil again. From a photographic point of view, I didn't get much. There was no real subject, which made it difficult, but it was a cool experience nonetheless. The search for further shelter brought us to Half Moon Island and that was to be our final encounter with penguins and seals.
I managed a few more wildlife landscapes here and I really liked this penguin shot with the mountains in the background. What struck me most here though was the temperature. You get a sense of it from the heat haze captured in these clips. I've got no idea what temperature it was, but I wasn't wearing a coat and had it not been for carrying a bag and two cameras and wearing a life vest, I honestly would have just stripped down to a t-shirt and that was kind of concerning. I didn't want to make this a video about climate and the environmental impacts of humans and Antarctica, but it's kind of hard to ignore. I'm fully aware of the impact that I've had by going there and I'm still wrestling with how I feel about this and honestly I'm not quite sure. On the one hand, everything I've captured here and the stuff I've spoken about might make more people want to go there, which will in turn have a greater impact. But on the other, I'm able to show the beauty and fragility of this place and show why it's so important that this needs to be protected. I can do that through this video and from talking to people and educating children on it as well. I'm going into my kids' school later this week to show them why it's so important that we do everything we can to protect these kind of environments. And I hope that by inspiring people to want to protect these places, the net kind of cost of me going there is outweighed by that. I don't know though. Half Moon Island was to be the last time we'd set foot on Antarctic land. The weather started to change more dramatically and as we headed back towards King George Island, sea conditions worsened and cloud moved in. Zodiac cruises were off the menu due to the swell, but despite this, we were treated to some spectacular views as we navigated Escura Inlet and Potter Cove. And honestly, I'm not actually sure which is which, or if I even captured both. Energy levels were definitely down and five hours sleep a night for the last two weeks was absolutely taking its toll. I really like these last two shots I took in Antarctica and how they seem to perfectly summarize the beautiful light you get here. Our final day had come, but with some slightly unsettling news. The weather again was playing havoc with flights in and out of King George Island, which was pretty inconvenient given that all of the passengers had ongoing flights booked and some of us were supposed to be driving to Patagonia. This was really a telling reminder of how wild this place could be. On that note, apparently it's actually harder to do a medical evacuation from Antarctica in the winter than it is to do one from the International Space Station. I say apparently these are second-hand facts, but honestly, I can believe it. We gathered for news of what our day would bring as everyone was now kind of desperate to get back to Chile. There will be no flights today or tomorrow or the next day. Maybe the day after that, but not 100% sure. It was at that point I noticed the ship was moving. Almost by stealth, we'd already set sail for the southernmost town in the world, Puerto Williams, via the Drake Passage. I expected mutiny, but I just think everyone was too shit scared to fight it. I'm not great on boats, and my enthusiasm for this trip was solely based on the promise of flying in and out of Antarctica. Yet, yeah, this news kind of made me a little bit excited. It's an adventure, isn't it? You sort of had to laugh. The two-day crossing was actually okay in the main, except for a couple of rougher moments, which somewhat reduced the lunchtime crowd. The shutting of the jacuzzi was hard to take, but pretty understandable given that they also closed all outer decks shortly afterwards. I managed to capture a bit of stuff before this happened, but I was fairly glad of a restful couple of days after a week that I really struggled to find the right words to describe, which is probably why I've spoken about it for quite this long. If you've got this far into the video, then I will be sending your certificate out in the post. Well done. I hope you've enjoyed my take on this Antarctic adventure and I said earlier that this has kind of changed how I feel about my photography and my work. In a way it's sad that a trip of this magnitude is what has made me fall in love with photography again but that's what's happened 
I feel like I've got this spark back and this joy to have a camera in my hand and be taking pictures again. And I've moved away from just limiting myself to shooting certain things at certain times and I've just taken this consideration that everything, well, maybe everything, is a potential subject to be photographed. Not everything has worked and not everything has fit in with my idea of what I want my photography to be. But it's been fun and that should be what photography is. I've got no idea how some of this stuff fits into a wider body of work and honestly I don't really care either. For the first time ever I feel genuinely confident in the shots that I'm taking and my thought processes behind them. My time as a leader on this trip has played a huge role in getting me there and I'm so grateful to Nigel for inviting me onto the Sylvia Rail for this expedition. Whilst the trip started with imposter syndrome, it ended with a feeling that maybe I do actually belong and I can do this. And it's also presented me with so many ideas of where I can take photography in the future. In the five or six weeks that I've been home, I just feel different, happier and more content and just okay with what I'm doing right now. For years, I've felt like I've been grasping at things with my work that have been just out of reach, but not now. Antarctica was life-changing for me, and I hope that this video has brought a little bit of inspiration into the lives of the people that have seen it. Thank you so much for watching. It really means the world to me.